Anderson Business Coaching inspires extraordinary organizational results by engaging the talents of ordinary people. ABC opens the communication links from the top to the bottom of the organization to tap into an untapped reserve of creative ideas and solutions by the people who do the work every day. Secondly, we identify external resources that have the experience and capability to develop systems and processes that the internal staff can manage. Morning. Welcome to another episode of Good Hearted Leadership, the show about people who do well by doing good. And we've talked about the principles before, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on those because today I've got a special guest who really understands leadership from the inside out. As a young man, he had a chance to participate in two NCAA finals, winning one and losing the other. In addition, he has been a, a, a master of leadership here in the Inland Empire, and he is currently the senior VP at Pacific Premier Bank and I'm so proud to be able to introduce Stan Morrison. Stan? Hi. Thank you, Ray. It's a pleasure to be here with you. No, it's a, it's a joy. You know, what I'd like you to do, if you can, Stan, you know, this is about leadership, and, and part of what we know from our own experience, good our leadership, is having the courage to make decisions that are unpopular and bringing other people with you. I saw a quote the other day that I really liked. It said, Cicero spoke and the people marveled. Caesar spoke and the people marched. Ooh. So tell me a little bit about you know, some of your experience. Go back to, to that, those, those early years when you were learning leadership on the team and, and how that all worked for you. Well, I, I worked, and I did, it wasn't work. I, I had an opportunity to play mm -hmm. for a man by the name of Pete Newell, who was a, a brilliant coach. Uh, uh, after we lost in the final game in 1960 to Ohio State, uh, in basketball, by the way, yeah. uh, it, uh, uh, our coach retired mm -hmm. and he became an athletic director, but he did coach one more short season, and that was the 1960 Olympic Games uh, in Rome. And they won every game by an average of 32 points, and he had people like Jerry West uh, and uh, Oscar Robertson as his guards. So it was an incredible team. And, uh, but I, watching him and watching the manner in which he treated people the way they needed to be treated, didn't treat everyone the same. Mm -hmm. Some people needed a thumb in the back and others needed a, an arm around the shoulder. Mm -hmm. uh, to watch that leadership style was really a, a great learning experience for me. Uh, I was so excited when I finally could go buy a car without calling coach to find out how he felt about that decision. And I, I thought he was one of the most strategically uh, well-groomed people I had ever met to understand how to take on a particular opponent and, and to do it with a way that made sense and allowed our team to stay in its strengths mm -hmm. and how to uh, uh, cause the opponent to play differently than they practiced, mm -hmm. which is really the essence of sports today mm -hmm. uh, from a defensive perspective. Mm -hmm. He was a genius. Uh, certainly your audience will all know John Wooden and uh, we had the pleasure of beating John Wooden eight consecutive times. So that's really meaningful. It tells you how great a coach Pete Newell was. Yeah. Well, I think the, I think the fact that you played uh, with the, uh, Oscar Robertson and Jerry West, and then and then beat Jerry West, you know, which is which is a real uh, testament, you know. But what what you said, and I think is really important, and what we're discussing here is strategic leadership. You know, the idea that that in order for you to change people, you have to first get them involved with a purpose. Tell us a little bit about how Pete was able to do that and then how that kind of taught you to move forward. Well, I, I think number one, uh, you know, if, if a coach or a leader walks in the door down, uh, all the employees or the players, mm -hmm. they're gonna be down too. Mm -hmm. But if the coach walks in, has that look in his eye mm -hmm. or her eye, uh, is, is enthusiastic, is highly organized, it lifts mm -hmm. the, the, the people who are following the leader. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that uh, one of the single most important ingredients or traits uh, of a great leader mm -hmm. uh, is predictability. Mm -hmm. uh, I know my coach is gonna be upbeat, positive, prepared, and ready to compete. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a great feeling mm -hmm. as opposed to having to throw your hat in every day mm -hmm. to see if they're up or down, how they are, do, do they have a drink of wine at lunch today, mm -hmm. all those things that mm -hmm. people look for. Uh, no, I know the same person is walking in the door every single day. Now there may be things going on in his or her life mm -hmm. that would 
you know, uh, cause them to be down, but they're not going to bring that to the workplace. And, and I appreciated that level of consistency and predictability more than I could ever tell you. And I, uh, I adopted that. I adopted that uh, a long time ago. I, and I think a lot of the traits that allow someone to be predictable, you make decisions about when you're 10, 11, or 12 years of age. Uh, are you going to be an enthusiastic person? Are you going to be upbeat? Or are you going to be a down guy and pessimistic? I think that's a life decision. And you already know, Ray, Ray the decision I made yeah. when I was 12. Yeah. 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 Well, no, it's funny. Uh, Einstein you know, has a lot of quotes, but one of them that, that really has always touched my heart is he said, the most difficult decision a person will ever make is whether the universe is a friendly or a hostile place. Well, that is really important. You know, I, I, Einstein had another great uh, quote when he said, we cannot resolve the problems we have created with the le same level of thinking with which we created them. Yes. We've got to go to a new place. Yes. And, and I think when, with a team in preparing for an opponent or a business when you're preparing for a project, mm -hmm. when you share that vision mm -hmm. and you share the process, here's how we're going to get there, mm -hmm. I think it becomes very inclusive mm -hmm. as opposed to the mystery mm -hmm. and all the surprises. There are going to be plenty of surprises, even surprises for the leader. Yes. Yeah. And, and so I, I think in that sense, uh, to hold on to those kinds of things. I mean, when you have great visionaries like an Einstein, mm -hmm. uh, I think there's something to be said for studying those kinds of people and seeing how they in fact operated as human beings and as leaders. No, I think that's very important. And I, you know, if I can, if I can piggyback on your athletic model, I had a, a plant manager that I really respect at one time, and he said to me, you know, off the cuff, he kind of said, you know, I really have to be careful about how I walk out of this office and walk onto the floor. If I don't have a smile on my face, they're all asking me what's wrong. So I have to bury my my feelings and walk out there as the leader. And that's exactly what you said about coaching. Yeah, and, and, and that gentleman, uh, that's great in, intuition. Mm -hmm. That's a great understanding of the human uh, dynamic. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really, really important. I think of all the, the traits that we have, I, and I mentioned predictability, I think the single most important trait of a great leader is communication skills. Mm -hmm. And for him to be able to communicate that to you is a real moment of learning for you. Mm -hmm. And it's a refortification for the speaker mm -hmm. to understand, I've got to continue to be as alert and to have that high level of consciousness about how I'm impacting others. Somebody had a, I, I don't know who said this one, but I believe that with respect to this, uh, with respect to uh, communication skills. Words can heal and words can wound. And I think people who understand that, uh, understand uh, something that my coach said after he saw me coach the very first game I ever coached as a high school coach, and he was there. And he came back to me, the locker room, because I was coaching every bounce of the ball, every pass. <laughs> and he said to me, you get more bees with honey than you do with vinegar. Yeah, yeah. I never forgot it, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think, and I think uh, to that point, you know, the, the issue of, of how we lead and the fact that you mentioned this very early on, saying that we have a tendency to lead people from where we are instead of from where they are. And what you said is that um, Coach Newell understood that some of you required that thumb in the back and others needed an arm over the shoulder. Tell us a little bit about that, how you, you were able to, to guide your people and why that became such an important part of your philosophy of coaching. Well, I think everybody understands in the world of athletics, we talk about the term potential all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, we hear about the term overachiever. There, there's no such thing as an overachiever or you wouldn't achieve it. Mm -hmm. uh, but achieving at your maximum level uh, is really the essence of successful coaching, uh, successful leadership, getting people at their absolute best. And I think going through the process of learning about people and learning what their strengths and weaknesses are is really important. Let me give you an example. Um, a lot of times uh, I hear people talking about thinking outside the box. Mm -hmm. The whole idea of doing that, and I think it's a very overused term, mm -hmm. but uh, the whole eye of idea of doing that is, number one, does everyone understand what the box is? And I go through an exercise where I say to them, everything I'm doing right now is my present. And as soon as I'm done doing it, it becomes part of my past. 
And everything in my past are my mores, my values, my experience, mm -hmm. my wisdom, and that impacts my present. So you get caught and they put a box around your present and your past. And the reality is the action is outside of there mm -hmm. where possibility is. Mm -hmm. Now, taking it one step further, with respect to strengths and people understanding what they can do well and what they don't, I do an exercise with young people that I mentor and I tell them, here's what I'd like you to do. The next 10 phone calls you get, and I want you to keep a sheet of paper with names and dates. Mm -hmm. I want you, if it's a close friend that knows you well or a family member, say, time out. Can I ask you a question? They always say yes. Mm -hmm. Tell me what you perceive my three greatest strengths to be. And people are more than happy to tell how they perceive this person. And I said, if you keep a record, you're gonna see a very strong trend. Mm -hmm. I remember the first time I did it, and someone said to me, your greatest strength is that you're six feet inch inches tall. Mm -hmm. I said, I never thought of that as a strength. Mm -hmm. I said, how do you mean? He said, well, you walk in a room and everything stops. Mm -hmm. I said, oh yeah, Godzilla just walked in the room. But to learn those things about yourself is sometimes very, very surprising to people to understand how others perceive you. And then I do another th exercise with them where I tell them, I want you to write everything where you are A plus in this business, in your leadership, where you're A plus. Mm -hmm. It may be speaking engagements, mm -hmm. working with budgets, mm -hmm. follow up in detail. Then list the things where you are B plus to B minus. Mm -hmm. Then list the things when you are average. Mm -hmm. And then list all those things where you are of absolutely no value to the company. Mm -hmm. And they get a kick out of doing that. And people know themselves mm -hmm. better than anyone else. And the whole idea is to keep people working in their strengths, mm -hmm. whether A, A plus, mm -hmm. B, mm -hmm. keep them there, mm -hmm. and learning how to manage your weaknesses. For a former coach, that was a very difficult concept because if I wasn't good against zone defenses, I would have spent a ton of time there. Well, what you find out is you just simply get a lot of real strong weaknesses yeah. by working. Yeah, but yeah. staying in your strengths maximizes the productivity of the organization. And, and that's the challenge to leaders, to find that about, I want to know what Ray does best, and I'm going to keep him doing it all the time because he's happy and we are really productive. Well, and I think, you know, one of the challenges I see in leadership is that if people don't understand that, they have a tendency to try to shore up their own weaknesses instead of finding people who can. I had the pleasure uh, several years ago of working with Jim Robinson, who was the president of Pratt & Whitney. You know, he had 10,000 employees. And he said to me, he said, Ray, you know, I had lots of people who were smarter than I am, was and, and a lot more capable, but they always worked for me because I understood that and I was able to help them solve the problem, get us to where we wanted to go. And you know, that's consistent with what I, what I just heard you say. And the other thing that I, that I liked about what you said that's consistent with that, knowing your strength of being tall, as I have, from, um, is that that can be a, a double-edged sword. And I think it was neat for you to say, that you've learned that when you meet with people, sometimes you lower your chair to be eyeball to eyeball. Tell us a little bit about that and why, why that's important in leadership. Well, I, I think people need to understand that we have all kinds of things in leadership we use. We have a desk that we hide behind. Mm -hmm. And many times, really strong leadership is to get out and go sit at a table over here mm -hmm. so you don't have this obstacle, a tie can be an obstacle for someone that walks in the room. Mm -hmm. You're dressed without a tie. And that is a very comforting thing to a lot of people because historically ties and, and suits mm -hmm. ha have become uh, symbols of positions of uh, leadership. It's part of my uniform. Mm -hmm. You know, if I was coaching, I'd be here in sneakers and a, and a sweatsuit, but mm -hmm. this is my uniform at uh, Pacific Premier. Right. And so th the fact remains that I was told by someone, I can loom because I'm so tall and I'm around people and they're, they're looking up that that's kind of a, a, a negative kind of a situation or, or uncomfortable one until they get to know you. Uh, but so what I do at my desk is I put the chair way down and if I'm on one side of the desk from someone, now we're eyeball to eyeball mm -hmm. and that goes away. Mm -hmm. Now certainly when I escort them out of the office or, or wherever we are, uh, 
I'm never going to hide from them. I'm very proud to be tall. Mm -hmm. I, have, yes. I have good posture. Mm -hmm. I believe in that. <laughs> yeah. and, and, uh, and, and there's nothing to be ashamed of any more than there should be anything to be ashamed of by being small. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. we, we are, vi we are. victims of or the result of circumstances. And here we are. And, and let's do something with it. Well, I think it goes back to the point you made, you know, is that, you know, sometimes we're blessed with strengths that we had no say over, and we're blessed with weaknesses that we had no say over. The, the, the question isn't whether we have them, the question is how are we using them, and how are we <clears throat> giving them away to help other people? And that's, that's one of the things, you know, that I want to talk about. You know, part, you've, you've, you've talked about shared vision, and as coaches, you know, it, it's so important for them to know this is where we're going. We may not make it today, but this is where we're going. Um, tell us a little bit about that in perspective of, of your growth as a leader and where you are today. Uh, because you've been a coach, you've been an athletic director, and now at this point in your life, tell us a little bit about your vision and what you would like to leave. What's, what's the legacy of Stan Morrison? Uh, that's, well, do we have about three days? For this? That's a great question, and thank you. Uh, I, I, I really do believe in sharing the vision. Uh, I think when everyone can get on the same bus and they're headed in the same direction, I think shared victory means so much more than individual victories. It's not even close. Uh, it's one of the wonderful things about team sports and, and one of the difficult things for a lot of leaders who have never participated in team sports. Mm -hmm. uh, we hear it a lot about uh, someone who happens to be the only child in their family. They didn't ever have to have, have the opportunity to be of a team of two with a sibling, or three or four or ten, mm -hmm. and and so I think there's something to be learned uh, with others who uh, are going through situations. You grow from those experiences. For me personally, uh, uh, you know, in, in coaching, I worked hard to really uh, make sure that we understood the mission and vision mm -hmm. of the university, mm -hmm. and and I'm the guy that sat in the living room when I recruited young people as a coach and looked the mom and dad in the eye and said. Are we in agreement that we're going to do everything we can to assist your son in graduating from this university? And everybody at that time is, oh yeah, absolutely, I want that scholarship. But when it comes time to be strong and to have the courage not to play that young man in the game because he's been cutting class, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. who has that kind of courage? Right, right. Now, I was never afraid to do it. I did it and, and at the detriment of the team. Mm -hmm. And that kid, our team paid a price. Mm -hmm. And maybe I needed to find another way, another punishment, if you will, uh, so they'll understand how important this is. And I used to tell families and kids, your legs will wear out, but your education never will. Mm -hmm. And that's true for me today. Mm -hmm. My education will never wear out, and I want to learn every single day, just as I am here. Well, as we take that into uh, uh, athletic administration, mm -hmm. uh, the, the same thing held true. Uh, I had coaches who needed to be supported. They had a set of rules, and here it came. And usually when you enforce that rule, it's going to be in the paper. Now, so often we read, well, Joe uh, was suspended from the team for breaking a team rule. Uh, and what does that mean? Which rule did he break? Well, they never tell you. And so we all speculate, you know, was he not going to class? Uh, was he out drinking? Was he doing drugs? Did he get picked up? Uh, did, was there a situation on campus? And we read enough of that in the paper uh, that they just get to this thing, breaking a team rule. Well, let's translate that to working at Pacific Premier Bank. Uh, I am so fortunate. I, I've kind of created a position that really hasn't been out there that much in the banking industry locally. And, and I'm reaching out to all kinds of nonprofit organizations and various leadership groups here in, in the Inland Empire. And I've had the pleasure of doing that from the platform provided to me by the bank. Mm -hmm. uh, I will bring in a lot of, uh, of our boards and we will have meetings in the corporate boardroom, this beautiful view. Mm -hmm. uh, they learn uh, how easy it is to park in our parking building and you get the, mm -hmm. the, you know, the, uh, the parking pass and we serve. And the, and the women see how safe it is. They see it's a shaded place mm -hmm. uh, in the summer, you know, when it's really hot. And then they get to meet my president mm -hmm. and our CEO mm -hmm. and other you know, senior executive vice presidents, mm -hmm. and they get comfortable in this community bank. And, and Pacific Premier 
is a bank that really is involved in the community. Mm -hmm. So when I bring these people here, later I'm able to take them to lunch mm -hmm. uh, or to breakfast and, and ask a question that all the time I coached and was an athletic administrator, I never got to ask anyone. And that is, how are your banking circumstances going? Right. I've never had reason to ask someone, are you happy with them, how yeah. things are going? Yeah. And then I can say to them, if, if you're interested in maybe making a change, please call me, because yeah. I'm in a position to make you very, very happy. Um, I was at a meeting this morning where I heard someone who is the ex chief executive of a large banking firm and talk about how excited their customers are. And they had a video mm -hmm. that demonstrated that. And to hear these people talk about being called by name mm -hmm. and being welcomed mm -hmm. and people shaking their hand. It, she didn't talk about, or any of them didn't talk about how much they were making on their deposit. Right. They were talking about how they were being treated. Right. And that's the essence of leadership. No, how are you being treated? And I think, I think that's the whole idea of what we're talking about is, is relationships. And as a leader, you either have a chance to build them or destroy them. And one of the things that we talked about very briefly, and I'd like us to go into it uh, in terms of your working with millennials, helping, helping uh, both athletic, business, and nonprofit leaders deal with that group out there who wants meaning as opposed to maybe a job which might have been more relevant in our period. Yeah, yeah. In, in our time, we looked for a job and went to wherever that job was, that city. Mm -hmm. Today, the millennial, and, and by the way, I don't want to be guilty of with one paintbrush, you know, uh, painting everybody the same, uh, 83 million people for Pete's sake, but they look for a cool city and go find a job there. Mm -hmm. That's different. Mm -hmm. And they, uh, you know, it's, they have, it's simply they were raised and educated in a different fashion. Uh, they play a game of thumbs now. Mm -hmm. Everybody is in social uh, media. Uh, the, not many read newspapers. Mm -hmm. If I could give young people today, the millennials, one gift, it would be to give them the newspaper to read from front to back. Mm -hmm. I do that daily. I make sure I'm not in the obits, mm -hmm. okay? Yeah, right. And uh, to read about the car chase here and the choir at this university and this scientific discovery and this situation downtown with city council, to learn about more, mm -hmm. to grow and learn more about this place where they live called a city or a county or a state or a country. We've, I've found, in my personal experience, it's a pretty narrow education the vast majority have. Mm -hmm. But they are the smartest generation ever de devised yeah. in the history of man. Yeah. Yeah. They are so bright in narrow areas, and we've got to broaden that. And on the job, they can learn to broaden that right. in, in dealing with people and other things. Uh, the, I, I had an occasion to speak with a, a large group out in uh, the desert and about 150 people. And one thing I said to them, when the young millennials come to you, understand, you need them. You need the skills. Mm -hmm. We are, you and I, Ray, we are uh, technology immigrants. Mm -hmm. They are technology natives. Yeah. It is part of their DNA. Yeah. They <clears throat> understand it. So when they come in, we can't be sitting this way. Mm -hmm. We've got to be sitting this way. We need them. Mm -hmm. And we have something that they seek, mm -hmm. okay? Understand, they don't want that six month review. Mm -hmm. They want them daily. How am I doing? Mm -hmm. Also, they are seeking from us life experience, right. Right. wisdom. Mm -hmm. They want that so badly. It's, it's like almost the, the grandfather complex. Mm -hmm. Tell me about. Tell, you fought in the war. Mm -hmm. Tell me about it. What was it like on the farm? Mm -hmm. They want that. That may be part of that daily newspaper they're not getting. Mm -hmm. And they certainly want it. I will tell you, I have worked with some of the most magnificent, productive, team oriented. They are great team players. Mm -hmm. And they want to get it done now. They are very task driven. They want to do it now. Mm -hmm. And what's next? Yeah. They want to grow. They want to grow. They want to grow. I, if I had my way, I, I can tell you the names of five that I would hire right now. I don't know what business I'd go into, but I would hire them and we will be so successful overnight, you can't believe it because they are so driven, so organized, so detail conscious, incredible follow-up. Mm -hmm. and, uh, 
and they are really goal-oriented people. Well, and I think one of the things that I shared with you before the episode began, but you know, one of my visions has been we have all these North End baby boomers, you know, people like yourself and myself, who, who are struggling to find somebody to take over because the kids don't always do that. And we have all these young millennials who are looking for an opportunity. And one of my goals has been to connect um, guys with less than five employees or gals with guys and gals who are young who are saying, I'm looking for an opportunity. Part of when you're working with millennials, you know, how do you see us being able to develop a model that would, would enable us to engage that? Because we don't want to lose the wisdom. We don't want to lose the talent, the financial, and all the others that is sitting there is kind of a, um, a, a, an opportunity waiting to be uh, given to them. Uh, that's a great question, and, and it's probably a question that's on the mind of millions of people in our country right now who see themselves aging out of their profession, aging out of their business. I will tell you this, uh, there, there's a book out uh, called Die Broke, okay? Don't share it with the kids, yes. go spend it, travel, die broke, okay. And, and, and I don't plan on dying yeah. broke. Uh, and there's another one that needs to be written, and that is Die on the Job. Mm -hmm. uh, there is something about the interaction with people. Mm -hmm. There is something about the day-to-day -day repartee, the intellectual stimulation of dealing with challenges, projects, people, circumstances that allows people to keep going in their job. Mm -hmm. So just because someone said, on an insurance chart, mm -hmm. at this point, you know, historically people have died, or at this point people have stopped working. Not now, mm -hmm. not now. Right. You can keep going if you stay intellectually involved. I'm, a lo I'm involved with some folks uh, who are very much into the long life issues. Mm -hmm. As you know, there are five blue zones in the world where people are living well into their hundreds. And I have a personal goal in that regard. And I have no intention of rolling over or retiring, none yeah. whatsoever. Yeah. And keep going. That doesn't mean you can't take vacations and go on cruises and trips and things like that. What it does mean is you're staying involved. And if you're staying involved, that keeps you open to teaching simply by how you are being mm -hmm. day to day on the job mm -hmm. with other people who are coming in that door, young millennials who seek that life experience that you have, mm -hmm. who seek that wisdom, mm -hmm. who seek people who've had it tough mm -hmm. and bounced back and what they did to do it. Mm -hmm. They can learn oh, on the absolutely. job. Yeah. And, and, and I, think, I think rather than finding a secret formula so they can hand it over, I think stay on the job, hand it over, but remain a mentor, remain deeply involved because you know what's out there and they don't. No, that's very good. Uh, Stan, I want to thank you, and I'm going to have to wrap up the show, okay. and maybe we'll do this again. Oh, I'd love All to. Right? Thank you so much. Uh, thank you again. I wanted to say to the audience, uh, this has been a real pleasure. We've, been, we've had this opportunity to talk to a leader who's been at all levels, and we want to thank you. Come again. We're going to be doing this again next month. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. Anderson Business Coaching inspires extraordinary organizational results by engaging the talents of ordinary people. ABC opens the communication links from the top to the bottom of the organization to tap into an untapped reserve of creative ideas and solutions by the people who do the work every day. Secondly, we identify external resources that have the experience and capability to develop systems and processes that the internal staff can manage. International Day Spa is a quiet retreat where you can escape and renew your body, mind, and spirit. Offering massages, facials, waxing, body wraps, and hydrotherapy treatments. Our 100-year-old Victorian cottage in historic downtown Redlands is a peaceful oasis our guests love. International Day Spa's newest treatments include Himalayan salt stone massage, red clay body mask, and an express power peel. We are open 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. every day, and appointments can be scheduled by calling 909-793-9080.